Okay, we are live here at Myth Vision Podcast. I'm done playing games. We're not going to play any music intros. We're going to cut the crap and get straight into this interview. But first, I do have to advertise a few things. I think it's necessary. You know, Christians, um, oftentimes apologists, want to tell you, you know, listen here, do you really want to risk it, you know, and burn forever in eternal conscious torment uh, by an evil creator? Um, where did I get this idea from? Well, I mean, if you just read a little bit of Litwa's work here, the evil creator, you'll figure it out. But we have one that's even more of a solid for you. Okay. So you can purchase one of these books and you'll send one of your loved ones through purgatory instantly, right? That's a quick way to kind of get them through that purgatory. And yes, this is an indulgence, but, uh, we're okay with that. There's nothing wrong with it. As long as it's sanctioned uh, orthodoxy or neo-orthodoxy in some form of our cult. However, there is the Patreon, okay? If you want deification, if you want to actually get an ascension, okay? You want to be known as a god? Well, you can go into this little Patreon here. You can literally click you are a god status, become a patron of Dr. M. David Litwa's work, I'm going to be checking. Dr. Litwa, how many patrons do we have here? Uh, you kind of hid that from the from the audience, but you got to let me know at least by the end of this interview if we have at least achieved a few more gods. Can you do that for me? <laughs> sure, Derek. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. As long as you know that. Now, if you want to be a god above god or the god human, uh, you can go beyond that, okay, if you want. But anyway, this is one of the things that I like to do is I like to – give my scholarly friends a platform that they can come educate, get their books and their knowledge they've worked so hard for so many years to acquire out there to a general populace. You know, oftentimes we have to break it down because you don't have PhD students always in the chat. Um, but you can learn a lot more by joining the Patreon. And this is my way of giving back to him. And your yeah. way to also do that is to join the Patreon. So I'm going to literally let you say a few words about your Patreon before we get started. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks, Derek. It's great to be on the Myth Vision. Hello, everyone. Hello from down under. Great to see you. Uh, so I'm offering also a deal to people who join the Patreon. I know some of the books, because they're from academic publishers, are expensive. Okay. So I've got four copies of my book, Post-Human Transformation, I've got four copies of my new book, Carpocrates, Marcellian, and Epiphanes, The Evil Creator, and Found Christianities. And I will beat the Amazon price and ship it to you signed myself. Mm. But you've, you've got to join Patreon, um, and then we will work out the deal. And uh, so I've got to get rid of these books. Um, so... To those four people who want one of those four books, um, join, let me know. I'll send it to you signed. Sweet deal. Sweet deal. So you're not getting, you're not just joining for nothing. You're getting something out of it and you get to become a God. Like I said, the most important point, the Christians want to give you something, but listen, it's a false salvation. We know the true path. So join the Patreon. Okay. Also, uh, Myth Vision works very hard. We do have a Patreon. I try to connect everybody from like, let's become a family. You can private message us. In fact, Dr. Litwa messages through Patreon all the time. I get the emails and I'm like, okay, he's got some upcoming stuff that is exclusive that he's letting his Patreon members know about. Uh, saw some of those Zoom links and stuff that people can participate in. Go join his uh, number one. If you have enough and you want to get like wings in heaven, join Myth Vision's Patreon. Also, there's a course right now, The Unknown Gospels, Bart Ehrman is doing, and I'm actually one of the affiliates. So if you want to learn something about the Gospels, you can go there, and it helps me out by uh, joining up for the course. So with that being said, let's dive into a couple questions I've accumulated about while rereading Jesus Deus today. And I thought to myself, this is a great book. I mean, this really gets into the heart of contemporaneous issues going on right now. Like Paul within Judaism school. Yep. Did, you, oh, did you want to did you want to say something real quick about the ancient mysteries course that should be 
available soon too. Yes. So um, Neil said he should be done with editing the course by August the 1st. I have to have Mrs. Myth Vision set the course up, get it all organized up there, yada, yada, <laughs> yada. And then we're going to launch it. And I think we're going to launch it around $40. There are hours and hours and years of information, academic condensed information pertaining to the mysteries that are being compiled here. But the edits alone are going to be like, you're watching a movie. You're like legit watching a movie and learning stuff that most of the world would like never know. So that's coming. You're going to want to be on the lookout for the courses. I forgot to mention that, but that yep. is coming. And we're going to have to do Mystery another Cults. live. Yeah, the Ancient Mystery Cults. But we're going to have to do another live on this. We're sure. going to have to when it comes out. Absolutely. I do want to say something about the Mystery Cults, though, because in your book, I did some screenshots of this in particular. And I was looking at how you were talking about the old school of religion and the new school of religion. And one of them is more German in their formation they're looking at the um they're looking at let me let me get my notes out here <clears throat> they're looking at so you say can, i wanted to ask you can we discuss the quest for jewish christology which seems to be this issue hegel was saying look hellenism from the third century onward like permeated the jewish world we can't speak of jewish slash something else hellenistic thinking as if pagans and Jews don't have like common uh, water in which they're swimming in. Everything kind of has impacted them by this time. So I want to mention Jewish Christology, which bucks against the old and new history of religion schools. And it appears the German schools looked to the imperial, imperial cult, the mystery religions, which you did a course on, and Oriental religion, especially Iranian tradition. You mentioned also pre-possible Gnostic um Jewish sources, but the new history of religion schools suggests the mother tradition, Judaism, exclusively is how we should see the development of Christianity. Can we get into this, dive headfirst into this problem? Yeah, well, so the basic the basic point of good scholarship is to do good comparative work, right? So you want to be open to potentially any and all cultural influences. So if you, for instance, if you walk into New York City today, you can get any number of cultural enclaves and influences that would affect people in New York City because it's a very cosmo cosmopolitan, multicultural kind of a place. Same thing with LA and thankfully, thanks to the internet, uh, there is multiculturalism, you know, streaming in basically now to everybody's YouTube account. So we're getting it. And the ancient Mediterranean world was that multicultural cosmopolitan place. And the goal of good scholarship, regardless of what you call it, is to be open to any and all information for understanding the development of early Christianity. So you could go to Iranian or Persian tradition. You could go to Syrian tradition. You could go to Athenian tradition or Roman tradition or Egyptian and, and Alexandrian tradition. And the Jews uh, were, if, if, they, if you want to call them the immediate matrix of Christianity, that's fine. But the Jews were everywhere in the... Mediterranean world. So they were in Rome, they were in Syria, they were in Asia Minor, modern Turkey, they were in Greece, and they were in Alexandria and Egypt more broadly. So they are part of the dynamic, intercultural, multicultural interaction. The old term for this used to be syncretism. That's not really, uh, I don't think, a help helpful term, but multiculturalism certainly. Mm -hmm. And so the world in which Christianity was born, yes, even if you want to see Judaism as the sort of first layer of uh, comparison, that's fine. But Jews themselves were some of the most multicultural people uh, in the ancient Mediterranean. And so they all know the Greek stuff as well. And they themselves are 
by and large, speaking Greek and part of the larger Hellenized populations. So, and this includes Palestine um, and everything, I mean, multiculturalism, the Greco-Roman multiculturalism, sometimes also called Hellenism, had spread very far as far as uh, even further east than Palestine. Remember, Israel is right on the coast, so it's open to all sorts of influences from everywhere else in the Mediterranean. But even if you went to Persia, you would see Greco-Roman influence, just like you see American influence in Iran today. So th this isn't, we're not in a bubble here. And uh, so Christianity isn't in a Judaism bubble. And Judaism in Greco-Roman antiquity doesn't look very much like what we think of as rabbinic Judaism today. So all forms of Judaism today come from a very specific stream of tradition called rabbinic Judaism, but that form of Judaism really didn't become dominant until the fourth and fifth centuries and only in Palestine and Babylonia. So the Judaism of Jesus is this, uh, and Philo and Josephus is this very uh, open cosmopolitan uh, kind of Judaism in which Jews, even if they're holed up in, in Qumran, they're familiar with Greco-Roman culture. And so they, they have astrological books and, and magic and, and, and all sorts of things that they're in, interested in. And they're known as miracle workers. And so they're, they're part and parcel of Greco-Roman culture. So I've got one more question because I can't agree with you more. I was in uh, Kuwait in 2010 on my way back from Afghanistan and they had a KFC and I don't know why I felt maybe I was more at home. I went and got me a KFC sandwich at the local KFC. And then when I went to the mall, I felt like I was in America in uh, Kuwait. So I was like, they're, they're driving all the same cars. They've got Mustangs and they got the whole nine yards, like literally. Uh, so I'm thinking, wow, there's a lot of a cultural, a culturization here, if you will, uh, cosmopolitan ideas that are spreading. The only thing they did that we don't really do often is smoke hookahs on every corner. But other than that, you know, <laughs> um, my other question I have, Dr. Litwa, I had to write this down because it's a little complex, but I hope our audience appreciates the complexity of this one because this really gets into the debate of Christology, if people want to call it. You like to put it in the lowercase c in your book, Jesus Deus, for good reason. Um, but here it is. Are there any other gods who were pre-existent and became human, then were exalted or deified back to heaven? Any contemporary examples that may have influenced Paul in the Philippians to him? Or do you think these were two different groups of thought floating around during Paul's day? And then I wanted to give Jewish examples. I thought you were noting here. Examples of this include Enoch. And I don't know if this meant pre-existent and then was exalted, but it seems that Enoch identified with the son of man in 1 Enoch 70 through 71. Jacob identified with the firstborn of every living thing, the prayer of Joseph. And Jesus identified with the logos, wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 1.30, and of course, John 1.1. 1, 1. In you you gave Jewish, I thought, examples similar to that. Are there any Greek and Roman ones? So is there an example of a pre-existent comes into the flesh and then goes back to be exalted um, figure, most likely in the Greco-Roman world? I guess that's to, to sum up the question. Well, it's a good question. And um, I'll just give you a sense for how scholars do comparison, just a, a methodological remark, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, it's very important not to be Christianizing when we do comparisons. And so if we're looking for parallels, um, that's really not the best way to, to go about it. The best way to compare is just to take something on its own. So okay. if you become if you become a classicist or uh, expert in Greek Roman literature, you'll read a lot of Homer and Livy and Virgil and things like that. And you're not asking like Christian questions of these figures because they don't know anything about Christianity. Um, Plato too. I mean, these guys are just hundreds of years before Christianity, and they don't know much about Judaism either. So, but what 
and what I think is important is taking these people on their own terms and using language that they also are familiar with. So that's the first thing. And, and what I mean by this is that incarnation and incarnational thought is really um, sort of like intra, intra-Christian discourse. Um, now, there's something like incarnation in the Greco-Roman sources. Um, in my book, How the Gospels Became History, I talk about, there's a poem of Horace where he s- talks about the Emperor Augustus as a form of Mercury who was incarnated in obviously a real life historical person, um, Octavian, uh, who became Augustus, and performed things that were similar to the, uh, to the god Mercury and distinctive actions distinctive of Mercury. And then Horace said, when Augustus dies, Mercury will go fly back up to heaven. Um, that his his incarnation will be will be done, and so that's sort of like an incarnation. But what is most common? The most common pattern that you find in Greek Roman thought is more like a, what you might think of as a, a an epiphany. And an epiphany is much more like a Greco Roman thinking about how a god operates in the world. So a god can appear in a body. Um, like Hermes or Mercury appears to um, people, you know, in in the Iliad and uh, in the story of Philemon and Baucis, Zeus and Hermes appear to this couple in Asia Minor and they're given hospitality. And Homer himself says that the gods walk among us in disguise because they're looking in on us, seeing if we are doing good things and and bad things. Um, But then the question is, is, and, and, and occasionally a God will reveal themselves. So they'll come in human form, but then they will reveal their superhuman nature as in the case of Demeter or Demeter um, in the Homeric hymn to Demeter, where she is trying to deify uh, a young infant boy and uh, by putting him in the fire and rubbing him with ambrosia and his his mother the mother of the boy freaks out and then demeter just goes crazy and reveals her her true form she had appeared as a woman in flesh the flesh of an old woman but demeter herself is this gigantic woman with golden hair and when she reveals herself she her head basically hits the ceiling and there's this brilliant light that comes out of her face. And this most looks like what Christians think of as the transfiguration of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And it's an epiphany. So I guess the, the short answer to your question is the gods are always appearing in flesh. Um, but in most cases, those appearance, appearances are epiphanic and they are therefore somewhat um, temporary and short, short-lived. Um, There are cases, definitely, uh, if you turn to the Egyptian culture, where Greeks tend to think of incarnations of the ancient Egyptian gods. If you read the Hermetic literature, Isis and Osiris are pre-existent deities who come to Earth and fill the world with their wisdom and uh, teach us about the mysteries and about agriculture and about the crafts and then when their mission is complete they go back up to heaven and so that pattern is definitely there uh, but i think it's also important just to take these on their on their own terms um, is what i would say i i almost wanted to go into one idea the epiphany idea and apotheosis idea i've read some articles really interesting ones where the guy convinced me at the moment, you might be willing to twist my arm and I'll follow you back to the epiphany stance. But on this Mount of Transfiguration in Mark, he took the apotheosis approach that this is reflecting what will happen after Jesus's resurrection. Kind of like Paul says in Romans 1, 4, that idea that you talk about in your book, where you're like, by his resurrection, he becomes the son of God. Um, And that therefore he, he, you kind of see his deity form, but it was like a 
prefiguring of what was to come. Um, but do you take the epiphany position on that rather than the apotheosis one? Well, those aren't mutually exclusive whatsoever. That's what I was going to ask um, you, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then right. I'm going to Super Chat, so bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> so an, an epiphany just means a revelation of a, of a deity. And uh, so, yes, that's what happens often at the end of uh, an, uh, an incarnation, however you think of it, um, that, the, that the deity takes back its true form. In the case of Heracles, um, Heracles, you'll remember, is burned alive on Mount Ida. And it's said the way that his fate is described is he his flesh just kind of drips off of him. What he received from his mother, who was human, dripped off of him. And that what he received from his father, who was Zeus, basically floated up into the into the air as a kind of refined deified um like platform superhuman platform and that version of heracles now exists in heaven and that's how they described it and mythologically they described it as zeus sent down in order to take his son a, a chariot and it kind of swooped down and it took up that piece of 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 Heracles, which survived the burning. And that's really, I think, a fairly widespread pattern of thought that there's something human in us, mortal, but there's also something divine so that when you you die, assuming you've been good, um, you have something that survives, what Plato called the soul, which has a natural home in heaven. And very, very slowly during the Christian period, this idea sort of took over. And so that in effect, everybody could become a little bit like Heracles in that respect. I, I feel like starting our own apologetics on purpose. Now it would be a little bit deceiving, but either way, I would want to like make cases for why Hercules is truly a son of God or why, you know, anyway, uh, that's something that I've been thinking about actually doing. And in fact, I want to do that also with the emperor, uh, Augustus. I want to go and look at all the sources and what they say about him. It portends the whole nine and then, you know, compete with the other Christian apologist here and, and, and like <laughs> show my guy up against their guy. Anyway, uh, Robert Herring says, got gonna pay to say, Hey, to Litwa join both Patreons. I, he's already deified. Robert is already. Thanks deified. Robert. Yeah. Appreciate it. Good He's to just see trying you. to give people a taste of the glory that it comes with becoming a patron member. So <laughs> I've been saying this a long time. I hope that those who have ears will finally hear. If not, may their ears be opened. So thank you. Uh, Jason Sobeck, Lord of the Four Corners, is always here when you're here. You're fit in the self deify. Do you go with parrots like Apsethos, the Libyan or serpents with human heads autophoning like Alexander of Abanatitis? I can't even <laughs> say that. <laughs> That's great, Jason. Thank you so much. Um, I think you are crafting the English language in a way that is beautiful, um, even in this text here. Uh, autophoning. I love that. Um, yeah. I, so Jason is referring to my book on self deification uh, which is called Desiring Divinity. And this one has not been a favorite of many audiences, but I think what's useful to think about deification is that a lot of the forms of deification are actually self-deification. And so I argue that Jesus in John is actually a self-deifier, that he's proclaiming his own divinity. And rather than being made divine by his father, I mean, that's compatible, but he is just announcing his own divinity and sort of making it happen and really angering the Jews while that's happening. <laughs> um, and I think that this follows a pattern also followed by Simon of Samaria and by um, Allegenes in the Gnostic text called Allegenes. So I think Jesus fits yeah, into several, it, he fits into a, a larger pattern of Greco-Roman deification. That was the Jesus Deus bit. 
But I think when you're reading John's Gospel specifically, Jesus fits into the pattern of self-deification that we find in so-called Gnostic Christian literature. And um, many have called the Gospel of John the first Christian Gnostic text. That's not far wrong. Um, there, for the first time, you get a pre-existent being coming down, identifying as a god, and then telling people that he's going to go ascend back up and take people with him, and that there's no way to heaven except through him and through his gnosis, through knowing him. That follows a very much, I think, a Gnostic Christian trajectory of self deification where the goal of salvation is to engineer and generate our own divinity because, frankly, Jesus isn't unique. And this is not in John, but Jesus isn't unique. He That divinity which is in him is in all of us. And this was the message also of Carpocrates, that the divine soul, in terms of its quality, was no more perfected, or it was no more of a higher quality in Jesus than it is in any of us. And Jesus had achieved a certain level of moral perfection, but that, his experience is open to all of us. And in fact, the Jesus of John encourages people to do greater works than he did, because we can. And because he is divine and we are divine in exactly the same way. And that's the mystery. The Gospel of Thomas comes to mind. For whatever reason, you said some words that just came to mind. And it made me think about where in the Gospel of John, he says, I am the resurrection. Like, it's not like uh, you're waiting for this thing. I am it. And then I'm listening to Thomas, this Gospel of Thomas, and they're like, well, when is the repose of the dead going to happen? And he's like, it's already happened. Look around, but you can't see it. And so um, I've heard Elaine Pagels make an interesting interpretation of the Gospel of Thomas. And she kind of said that it, it, it's like he, she's telling Thomas the secrets. And she thinks the secrets are like, you are God. Like, this is the secret. You are God. When you look under the rock, I'm there. When you see here, I'm I'm everywhere because I'm you. And it's like this weird mirror type thing. Like the way that she kind of described it in my interviews, I'd have to go back and watch them because it was last year that I did these recordings. You brought it to my attention. Anyway, I just had to get that off my chest. Just a brief note there. I've got a an article, an academic article on deification in the Gospel of Thomas. I think it's absolutely there. And I believe I've got it on Patreon too. So um, there you go. Let me do a short little something in case people might people might be afraid here once they see the brightness and the glory. But, ooh, there's the patron. Join the patron. All right. We're going to the next one. Wayne Rossi. Thank you, everybody, by the way, for all the support you're showing and showering with the hard work we're doing here. What's your opinion on the provenance, or provenance, provenance sorry, of Mark? Is there reason to think it was written in Rome or in Palestine? What about the other Gospels? Well, thanks, Wayne. This is a this is a great question that any I think really intelligent reader of the Gospels should be asking. These texts are human texts; they didn't come from nowhere. Now, interestingly, they try to represent themselves as almost speaking from nowhere and right. having no authors. Um, none of them claims to be apostolic; uh, that is written by an apostle, um, and. We'd love to know where Mark was written. And uh, yeah, there's just a very, very few hints. And uh, basically that the author has knowledge of what's going on in Palestine right around the end of the Jewish war. And he puts a prophecy in the mouth of Jesus saying that no stone will be left upon another in uh, re with regard to the Jerusalem temple and temple structure. Now, this is interesting because we know that some stones were left on another, um, hence the Wailing Wall, which still exists today. So this author probably wasn't 
in Palestine itself. And he thought that the Romans had destroyed everything. So some say he was in Rome. Some say he was in Alexandria, some place where he could get news of what was going on with the Jewish war, but news that's not exactly precise or detailed because he put a prophecy in the mouth of Jesus that ended up not being exactly correct. And he wouldn't have done that if he knew better. So it doesn't get us very far, but, um, you know, we, we don't have any smoking gun arguments um, for any of these. Um, and I think that that's uh, a shame. But what I will say is it's important not simply to follow church tradition when hearing about theories of gospel provenance. So according to church tradition, Mark is written in Rome. And why do they think that? Because they think Mark is a disciple of Peter, who was essentially like the first bishop of Rome. Historically, that doesn't hold water. So be very wary of just repeating this confessional apologetic argument about Mark's Roman provenance. You would need actual better arguments rather than the traditional ecclesial tradition. The same thing with putting John in Ephesus. This is all based on church tradition. It doesn't have any anything else. So be very careful of that. Um, obviously, Luke, uh, I don't think, is a companion of Paul, although he fakes that in Acts. Um, it makes, makes you want to believe that he might be, because he uses we, the first person plural. But that is a standard rhetorical technique. And uh, so... Yeah, I think for me, uh, some healthy statements about what we can and cannot know are best here. And I don't think there's a smoking gun for the provenance of any of these. So I apologize, I can't be any more precise. Um, come back to us if you think there are good arguments um, and uh, I'll tell you what I think. I can't give you uh, any specifics, but I have been told there are Latinized terms or words in mark so they would argue rome itself would be the best fit so rather yeah, but than that's like saying thoughts. that's like saying you know there are americanisms used in um kuwait or there there are like english slang words in a text and then you want to find out where that text is written well it must have been written you know in america but not necessarily. It's like English slang is all over the internet. So a text that appears with English slang words could have been written in South Africa for all that we know, or Australia, where I am right now. I mean, it, it really, it's, it's a difficult thing to say. Rome is the conqueror of the entire Mediterranean world. So if we've got Latinisms in Mark, that could have been written anywhere where Romans had control, which is not just Rome and it's not just the Western part. So again, a lot of these arguments trying to put Mark in Rome are really, they don't hold water. They really, really don't. And we've just got to rigorously an analyze uh, and find a good argument. Thank you. Wayne, I hope that answered your question. Neil from Gnostic Informant. Thank you so much, Neil. Do you think Orphic Mysteries had any influence on Christian theology? Why or why not? Well, <laughs> so the first thing, again, this comes back to how do you compare things? And your first question in comparison, I don't think methodologically should be, did A influence B. That is, my purpose in comparing something is not primarily to find a genetic relation, right? Um, my purpose in comparison, is to, in, in comparison is to generate knowledge and to see what similarities and differences there are between two systems of thought or two rights or uh, two practices or whatever that it is that you're comparing. So, this isn't the question that I would start off with. The way I would start this, Neil, is I would 
just start with the Orphic Mysteries and I'd learn as much as I could. And then I'd try to learn as much as I could about ancient Christian theology. And then I'd look at both the similarities and the differences. The fact is no one stands up and says, you know, no Christian stands up and says, I got this from an Orphic poem. And that's just not what the ancients do. Um, we do know that the Jews, probably in Alexandria, had written a testament of Orpheus in which they presented Orpheus as a monotheist. So in that case, the direction is going the other way. Jews are trying to influence Orphic religion and trying to make Orpheus into a monotheist, which is a very, very common apologetic technique. <laughs> um, Orpheus, you know, and the Orphic poems are definitely whatever they are, they're not monotheist, and neither really is Judaism or Christianity in the ancient world. So I think we have to say that Again, we don't really know, uh, but definitely you could you could hypothesize and say that, well, for instance, um, we know that in Orphism, in the gold tablets, which were put into the mouths or on the chests of the dead, there were directions for where you were supposed to go in, in Hades or the underworld. And as it turns out, in several Christian texts, there are directions for talking to archons or angelic rulers and in Hades and asking them essentially where to go in the afterlife. So a friend of mine has written an article on that and said, I think the similarities are close enough to propose a genetic relation. Nobody stands up and says that they that the Christians got this. That no early Christian says that they got this from an Orphic text. But it sounds so similar, you know, where the Orphic text says, "When you get to such and such a location, two guys will ask you, who are you? Where are you from?" And you'll answer, "I am a son of Earth and starry heaven." And then a Christian text like the Apocalypse of James says, "When you get to the second heaven or whatever it is, you will be asked by the archon of Venus, who are you? Where are you from? And you will say, I am a son of God. That's pretty similar. And I'm just paraphrasing here. And then, yeah, then it's up to up for grabs whether you want to say that that's an actual influence. Mm. Remember that everything is entangled here at this point, you know, so it's sort of like asking the question, did McDonald's influence KFC or did KFC influence <laughs> McDonald's? You know, I mean, their advertising strategies are all pretty similar because they're entangled and they're learning from each other at the same time. Right. So potentially what we have to imagine is that Orphics are borrowing from Christians and Christians are borrowing from Orphics at the very same time. It's not a one way street. Yep. Thank you, Neil. Appreciate you. Don't forget to subscribe to Gnostic Informant. I really appreciate that. You have now attained true gnosis. Uh, <laughs> Jason Sobek, Lord of the Four Corners. Greek word of the day, histemi. What does it mean? Why is it important, especially in regards to Simon of Samaria? <laughs> well, thank you again, Jason. Um, yeah, histemi means I, I cause to stand. Um, and Simon of Samaria called, apparently in later tradition, called himself the standing one. And uh, he put it into a perfect participle called hahestos, but it's from histemi, and it is a declaration that you are an eternal being. And this was how many Jews and Samaritans referred to eternality. Like they don't come off and say, I'm an immortal being, immortal being a Thanatos, they use this other more Semitic kind of language and, and say, I'm the standing one. <laughs> and of course, there's that passage in, there's that passage in, in uh, Deuteronomy 5, I think, which Philo made a big deal out of, and which the Jewish God says to Yahweh, or says to Moses, sorry, you come here and stand with me on the mountain. And so Moses is actually the original standing one. That is, he participates in the eternality 
of God, basically. And that's a way of describing, that's a very Jewish or Samaritan way of describing Moses' deification. Like Jewish and Samaritan sources, unlike Greek and Roman sources, are very hesitant to say, you know, oh, so-and-so was a god, mm -hmm. or so-and-so became immortal. They'll use more language like Enoch becomes the son of man, or Moses becomes the standing one. But in terms of the conceptual apparatus involved, those ideas are pretty similar and and those only come from the greco-roman period so certainly here we're seeing that dynamic cultural interaction where the jews and samaritans are borrowing the deification language but it's not exactly how the greeks and romans used it they're coming up with their own innovative terms i love this stuff i think i kind of wondered if the transfiguration with having elijah and moses there next to Jesus plays into this, what you're describing here. Yeah, because they're just the two guys who were deified before Jesus, right? So right. both of them never die, and both of them have a long history of tradition. Well, Moses dies technically. Yeah, but, but Josephus doesn't think he's dead. He thinks he had a... Exactly. An, uh, yeah. So. Yeah, uh, and so you can't find his grave. Why can't you find his grave? <laughs> well, because he's not really dead. It's sort of like, you know... You can't find Ulysses S. Grant's grave. Um, there's a joke about that, um, which I'm changing. But and anyway, you, if you can't find somebody's grave, it means that they're not really dead, that they're actually deified. So there's no body left over. So there's nothing to bury. And the same thing with Elijah. He just right. gets caught up into heaven. And if you go to heaven, you can't go there in normal mortal flesh. You have to go there in an angelic body, which is another way of talking about deification. Thank you, Jason. Wonderful question. And I'm sure as I read more of your books, I will get acquainted with what your arguments are here. Uh, thank you. Abel Chavez, thank you for the super chat. Perhaps, perhaps Jesus, Judas is same person and Shroud of Turin is his reincarnation stuck like a photo. They twisted the story, and he was Sakari killer, murder, alpha, special forces, a Roman and Jew. <laughs> well, that's a mouthful. Uh, I don't know how serious this comment is meant, but uh, yeah, I, I think that one of the basic things that I keep telling people about scholarship is what, what people hear on the sort of the popular coming through popular uh, channels like through TV and radio about early Christianity. That, that's really not um, that's really not the best way to, to access early Christianity. There is a lot of literature out there which you can access by going through very carefully and looking at the best and and, and you know using Derek paying attention to who he's inviting, knowing the real scholars who are doing the real scholarly work, not just spouting, you know, whatever about whatever miracle Shroud of Turin business, um, but actually doing the detailed work and looking at the evidence and actually explaining to you the evidence for certain things, not just going parallelomania, not just saying anything because it sounds interesting and cool, but to say, here's how these things connect actually here's the evidence here's why i think so and here is the further literature and the resources that you can use to make your own decision okay if you have that you're you have real scholarship being done because scholars we don't know anything more than than you do but we are trained to think in a certain way to do the kind of work that is evidence-based and we want to empower, or at least I do, I want to empower everybody to think in that disciplined way because it's really a transformation of your thought that will, to use some of Derek's language, redeem the way, redeem your mind, I guess. I guess that's Pauline, sorry. That's You'll redeem your mind so that you can think and get out of the traps set for you by apologetic arguments. The worst thing that you can do, I think, and is is basically become an anti-apologist, which isn't really, uh, which is just going to bother the apologists and then cause a blue in the face argument. What you want to do is really get knowledge. 
So Neil's comment, you know, that you have just attained true gnosis, that's really what we're all after. And when you've attained the true knowledge, you don't care about the ducks quacking. Honestly, and you don't have to watch every YouTube video that is on the Shroud of Turin, which, let's face it, folks. I if mean, you're going to watch one, look, you got to watch the one that I've done, okay? <laughs> so first of all, this is Dr. Andrew. I can't remember his last name. He actually uh, specializes on the church when it comes to relics and the history of relics, why they invented them how and when and all that kind of stuff and like how important they were and goes back into ancient debates about images on objects such as coins and such and how are the debates in churches. Now this one is more like cutthroat in your face, anti um, shroud of turn apologetics where this is uh, Andrea Nicolotti and uh, Andrew Casper interprets from Italian, this scholar who is actually located a hundred feet, his office is 100 feet from where they house the shroud today. And historically, he point blank shows that we have record of this uh, in the 13th century. And people were saying it was invented. It was literally and it's one of the last relics of a shroud about Jesus that was ever invented. So there were much earlier shrouds created. And the one we have today is late Johnny come lately. So historically, you want to look and examine this carefully, get into the historians, check what they say, see what the sources say, because even people from the 13th century were saying this is fake. So I'd be very cautious to draw those kind of conclusions. Abel has been like an angel in the chat, though, even if I can't understand a lot of the super chats, like just showering us with blessings here at Myth Vision. So at the very least, Abel, thank you so much for that. My father was retired special forces. And he spent 30 something years. So I saw that and that was okay, cool, cool, cool. Special forces. But I honestly don't understand a lot of the things you're trying to say. I'm not going to lie. Um, I have a very hard time knowing what you mean by some of these uh, super chats. But like I said, they're over my head a lot of times. Anyway, moving on. Jason Sobeck again. And he did not mean the gospel of Peter. He corrected himself. He meant to say acts of Peter gets pretty dang wild talking dogs and babies and kung fu battles in the air how would these tales have been received in antiquity yeah so this is a great example acts of peter is a great example of, of early christian apologetic literature about peter and what he did in rome and yes it's pretty interesting things so peter makes a dog talk in rome there's a piece of dried fish that peter throws into a pool and then it essentially uh, resurrects and becomes a real fish. Um, <laughs> Peter Peter makes, uh, and then Peter, yes, has a sort of a midair battle with Simon of Samaria, who is flying over Rome, and Peter basically sends out- now, this happened. Just so <laughs> this really happened. Please continue. Peter, yeah, he, he sends out an imprecatory prayer that is a curse, which is commonly used in magic spells. And he basically sends Simon tumbling back down to earth and he breaks his leg. Or in some versions, he dies and is split apart in this ugly, gruesome uh, image. <laughs> so you can tell there's real hatred here of, of Simon. Um, that's, I think, one thing that maybe you could take away historically, that Christians of the late second century, they were really threatened by simon and simonian christianity so they did what they could to kind of destroy him and and their rhetoric becomes even more inflamed as you go on into the third and fourth century in the pseudo clementines it gets even wilder you know they become so anti-simonian they just kind of go crazy so that's what i think you might take away historically but then the question is how would the ancients have taken it and i think this is a really nice question right because it's it's a historical question. It's not how we would how we take things, right? Because how we take things is we we dismiss this kind of stuff as just you know tabloid trash. But then the question is, well, what's the range of plausibility for an ancient person? Are they capable of believing this stuff? That's a really interesting question. And I my sense is if you are a religious believer and your guy, the hero, is the one performing the miracles, then yes, absolutely, you can believe some of this stuff. And I think that, 
I think that many Christians of the late second century believe that Peter was this amazing wonder worker. And you see this even in the acts that got canonized in the New Testament. All Peter has to do is basically like walk by some crippled guy and yell at him and say that, you know, get up. And he and he gets up and Peter can kill people, too. I mean, that happens with Ananias and Sapphira. You know, poor couple, they don't, you know, report their church taxes correctly. And Peter just sends them to death with a word. Do Christians believe that? Yes, because that's the insider discourse and I think that probably there's Christians today who believe that that stuff actually happened. So that's not too crazy. Um, you know, people believe that Acts is a history book. And why do they believe that? Because they've been trained since Sunday school to do that. And it reads so much like, you know, somebody has done their research. It's got a preface, you know, it says, oh, I've, I've done my research and I'm going to tell you what really happened. Therefore, <laughs> this is what really happened, of course, you know. <laughs> but then once you come out of the community, once you are disengaged from the religious community, then yes, those plausibility structures start to break down. And you're like, well, Buddha did the same things. And I don't believe Buddha, you know, so why should I believe that Peter did that? You know, so that when you start comparing, um, yeah, you begin to see the problems. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do is compare and educate in the process. There are people we've never even heard of. You'll be shocked to find out what they've done. And like, eventually, like, why don't I follow this God? Like, why the heck am I following <laughs> this goddess? You know, anyway, <laughs> uh, seriously, great, great uh, words from you. Uh, uh, Neil said you're a sage. Cheryl, uh, Cheryl Lyle, thank you so much for that super, super chat. I'm looking, Cheryl, to see if I missed any of your comments. I just don't want to leave you hanging because you've been showing love in the chat a lot. And Okay, I scroll down quite a bit. It seems like you didn't. You're just showing some love. Thank you so much. Thanks, um, Cheryl. Yeah, Larry Montgomery. And by the way, I took, in fact, let me get rid of this banner because we're getting closer to the hour and everybody loves to throw a super chat up. I don't want to keep you too, too, too long. I don't want you to be like that guy again. Um, but I did pin the Patreon at the top. I want to test those numbers and see if we got somebody to join so that they can have true salvation. Because if they don't join it, they're going to, like, I don't even want to tell them <laughs> what's going to happen. You know, it's, it's not good. It's not good. Uh, Larry Montgomery, thank you. Did Jesus believe the book of Genesis was historical? I think that's what they meant to say was Genesis. Well, I've often gone on record um, saying that in terms of what Jesus actually believed and did and said, I don't really think that we can reasonably know anything because the documents that we have are really about what the church or church is thought that Jesus did and said many years after Jesus supposedly did and said those things. So that's not a mythicist position, but that's a historical skepticism position. So what the question that a scholar would ask here is, in which gospel specifically does Jesus cite Genesis and why would that be important for the person who wrote that specific gospel? So if you take Matthew, or what's called Matthew, he presents Jesus as using an argument from Genesis with regard to marriage or divorce, and he says, yeah, you shouldn't get divorced because that's not God's will, because God brought together Adam and Eve, and there you go. And it was only because of your hard hearts that Moses allowed you to give a bill of divorce, right? So in that presentation of Jesus, he seems to believe in a literal Adam and Eve and seems to quote Genesis as an authority. So I don't know maybe in terms of that presentation, G Jesus thought that there was a real literal Adam and Eve. And if that's true, Jesus was not very smart. Let's face it. I mean, uh, you know, but that's Matthew. Okay. That, End that's of the show, Matthew. ladies and gentlemen. Let's wrap it up. No, I'm just kidding. 
<laughs> That's Matthew telling you what he thinks Jesus would have said about Genesis. We don't know if Jesus said anything about Genesis or if he believed in a real Adam and Eve. And why would you believe in a real Adam and Eve? I mean, you have Greeks and Romans believing in, you know, their ancestors growing up out of the ground too. So maybe it's not dumb to believe in Adam and Eve, but maybe it's dumb not to do the comparisons and to realize that everybody else has a different creation story in which one is the right one. So these are the more scholarly kinds of questions. And then this will take you into the earlier question about where was Matthew written? By who? For who? For what purpose? Right. The questions that we need to answer in order to get at the truth in which we're still trying to answer. Well, you just angered every apologist who watches this channel. Thank you so much, Dr. Litwa and Larry. <laughs> Seriously, Larry, thanks for the question. Constellation Pegasus, why does the Bible still have verses 19 through 29 in Mark's last chapter? I think it's, well, isn't it 16? I thought, anyway, I, I got, maybe I'm wrong. Bible commentary itself says they are seriously doubted and the text does not match the writing style of the rest of Mark. Yeah, this is an unfortunate tradition that every Bible that is printed today, if you're reading in, in English, is informed by church tradition. And although that every critical scholar knows that Mark, I think it's verses uh, 9 to 16, is um, not part of the original version of Mark, those verses are still printed merely as a repetition of church tradition because, not because that's historically correct. And then, you know, some Bibles or commentaries, as you know, you know, say that this is not original. And that's the best that they can do. But nobody seems to have the courage just to say, let's not print that, right? Because even so-called secular publishers who make money off the Bible don't have the balls to take something out. Mm. And that's really the sad state of affairs we're in today. And it's why I say to people, listen, I don't know where you are in life, but stop reading in English. Learn Greek. It'll take you two years of disciplined effort. It will change and revolutionize everything that you know and have read about early Christianity. Don't, don't make yourself dependent on these theologically loaded translations anyway, which are all different and none of them really accurate by the very nature of being a translation. But this especially is deadly, where they leave crap like this when they know that they shouldn't. Thank you. Constellation, great question again. I can tell that you've had this question a lot. I appreciate the support. All right, moving on, trying to keep the time somewhat uh, sensitive here. Abel Sheva says, the Torah Bible and Quran are inversions of human nature. They flipped everything and made it heavenly, but masquerade stole our in reincarnation process. Maybe. I mean, <laughs> uh, I think you're talking beyond my level of knowledge there, Abel. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's interesting that some people, yeah, I mean, we, we know that religions are learned activities, right? No one is born a Jew, a Christian, or a Muslim. And that religions like the great Semitic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, they take a lot of repetition and inculcation, right? To produce a Christian or Jew or a Muslim. Um, and, you know, you, you need to go to church every Sunday and you need to go to mosque every Friday and to the synagogue every Saturday to sort of get reinforced in, in, your, in your religion. Because otherwise you'll sort of forget things or it won't sound very plausible anymore. And you'll just become apathetic and leave the faith. Now, I don't know if it's a flipping of human nature, but I, I do think that these are doctrinal styles of religion, which need a lot of reinforcement. And, uh, you know, 
I there think is that's a that's... sense in which the human nature is kind of forced to do things that don't come natural in, in a lot of ways. Absolutely. I mean, you know, all these faiths can tell you to their blue in their f blue in the face that, you know, premarital sex is bad. It doesn't mean that good Christian, Muslim and Jewish kids don't do it. Right. I mean, and you're never going to stop it. I mean, are you ever really going to stop it? No, no, you're right. never going to stop it. We are built <laughs> with real chemicals and hormones. You can tell me, you know, the law of Moses and the law of God, but I'm in the end going to follow the law of my body. And sorry. Right. I mean, unless you want to modify my body some way, which there were people know. who did that. Yeah. Some religions have tried that too. Right. Um, now, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't want to bad mouth religion, but I, I think that it, you could maybe say the same thing about democracy, that democracy is not really uh, fit for human nature, that really we're just, you know, apes who stood up in the grassland and it's really a war of all against all. And human governments are just like, you know, these fake things that we've set up to protect each other. And the real human nature is now being shown in Ukraine where we're just killing each other uh, by bombs and missiles. And that's who we are. You know, we're just apes now with bigger guns. So I don't know it, this is a philosophical question. I appreciate your response. You had a lot of things go off in my head. I have to move on. Cheryl Lyle. Thank you so much. I knew you had to have a comment. I was like, this is a weird thing. You just dropped something. So thank you. Do you think Saul's conversion in Acts 9 was an epiphany? Yeah, I do. I think that's a better way to describe it because conversion is another one of these like Christian terms that really gets developed in the fourth century and beyond. Like Augustine invents in many ways the concept of Christian conversion by describing what effectively was his own experience. And then, you know, in 19th and 20th century America, there's all this emphasis on conversion. But you really don't, you don't hear actually even in New Testament texts using this word. Um, what is happening, yes, is, is Saul has an epiphany of a deity, and the deity is not Hermes or Apollo, it's Christ. He sort of looks like Apollo because he's brighter than the sun, but he identifies himself as Christ, and this is what convinces Paul that, um, yeah, he should become a devotee of this deity. And that pattern of seeing the God and then being loyal to or devoted to the God is all throughout the Greco-Roman world. This happened all, of, all the time, all the time. There's nothing unusual. Mm, thank you so much. I appreciate that response. Constellation Pegasus is back. Thank you for that super chat. What are your thoughts on Genesis teaching flat earth and dome cosmology? Yeah, I probably think that that's um, what it says originally to the Hebrew author who was, you know, way back in the day. Um, probably he did think that. Um, and yeah, that the, the, the sky is more like a hard plate or a hard bowl sort of. And that there was a layer of water on top of it. And um, I think that he literally thought that. And, I, and I, I think that until you get Hellenistic cosmology, here's the interesting bit. In the third and second century, when you get Hellenistic cosmology, that whole world picture change, changes. So that by the time Jesus and Paul are reading Genesis, they don't believe that dome cosmology anymore. It's just like us who now have a much wider vision of the universe. Right. We don't we don't believe what the Hellenistic cosmologists said, that there were seven planets in concentric spheres rotating around Earth. We don't think that anymore. And an apologist would read Genesis trying to support a modern scientific cosmology. They, just they like, do, yeah. Just like Philo, in his day, read Genesis to support a Hellenistic cosmology. Kind of like the seven days where God rests on the seventh become epochs of time because, well, 
evolution. And now we got to explain evolution. So we fit that into Genesis somehow. Yeah, it happens over and over. I can't wait to find out what we discover next that we found in these ancient texts that have been there all along. You know, <laughs> Oh, this is wonderful. Constellation, you're the man. Did you want to make a quick? Oh, I just quickly on that. That's really the pattern for religious people. And I think it's OK to be religious. I'm not saying it's bad. But when you become religious and you have a, a doctrine that you need to support, where the human mind is generated to find connections and to find ways to justify our prior beliefs. This is what makes the human mind such a miracle, but also such a disaster, because we all have this terrible self-confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. So if we believe that Genesis is the word of God, then it has to be right. And by, you know, by God, we will figure out a way yeah. to read, you know, Galileo in Genesis Right. Or we will find a way to read Einstein into Genesis. That's the power of the human mind. We we misrecognize the fact that we read something into it and then we convince ourselves that we got it out of it. I interviewed Bart Ehrman once. It was one of those paid programs by one of my followers who was just like, I want to see this happen. And it was we dove into the Greek. We got into some like pericope apologist arguments about well, you know, Matthew doesn't really contradict the other Gospels. Uh, Jesus didn't literally ride two donkeys. It's, it, he was trying to parse out and say that he threw two of the cloaks on top of one donkey. And so he sat on one donkey, but there was a, you know, a, a baby colt right next to it or whatever. Some, some way to get out of it, right? I mean, we did this for a whole hour. I was burnt out just reading my, <laughs> my notes, right? And then Bart's burnt out going through it. And he finally goes at the end, Derek? If someone wants to harmonize bad enough, they will do it no matter what. So like he was frustrated at the end of the show and I get it, but I don't think he anticipated us to go that deep into the Greek and die because <laughs> you know how crazy we are at myth vision. But he was like, listen, apologists will do anything anything they will they will trip how do you know there wasn't uh there's something else there how do you know that and like if it's if there's a chance it reminds me of this right here then we'll move on i have to i have to I think you're gonna appreciate this one right here you mean not good like one out of a hundred i'd say more like one out of a million So you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah! <laughs> Stupid. I had to. I had to. All right. All right. Thank you, Constellation. We got to blast through these. Uh, everybody, I appreciate it. If no more questions, um, we have to get close to the end because the apocalypse of the Patreon is soon. If you don't join... <sighs> I wish I could be cut off from my myth visionaries for the sake of them, for the promises and, uh, and, and all of the portents and everything are about them, but God's going to have to graft in other people somehow. Anyway, uh, that's another story. Italis is Jesus confrontation with Legion symbolism for a skirmish between an army plus Jesus running people into a river is a classic envelope envelope military tactic. What are your thoughts? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah, um, it's a great it's a great indication that Mark is written for a Greco Roman audience because no one, <clears throat> I mean, no one would understand if 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 you asked like a demon in like the twentieth century or maybe sixteenth century Salem and said, "Who are you?" They wouldn't answer Legion because Legion is um, or Legion is just a Roman military formation. It's a group of six thousand guys with swords that move in a certain way. Um, so that's, yeah, that's very, very specific, very culturally specific. Yeah. And I think it's un indisputable that Jesus is being shown as a kind of warrior who's able to defeat an entire legion or brigade of demons and send them not into a river, but into the Sea of Galilee. And when Derek gets to the Sea of Galilee, he'll see where people point out where this supposedly happened. But honestly, there's no good place. Right. unfortunately um it just doesn't work but it's a great story thank you italis i appreciate that steven the storyteller 
Thank you for the big super chat. What is your opinion about the authorship of the Johannine works? Thanks. Well, so <clears throat> I appreciate your question, Stephen. I think that they're all probably early second century. Um, as I said earlier in the show, there's good evidence that uh, the Gospel of John is already dealing with what we call Gnostic currents in Christianity and is in fact presenting a very Gnostic version of Jesus. And those versions of Christianity are all second century, early, quite early second century, but all second century. Um, and what I think you see in the Joannine epistles is you see a Gnostic Christian battling against other Gnostic Christians. So a lot of people have said that, uh, you know, the epistles are anti-Gnostic, but they're, they're written by Gnostics. Um, so uh, they're, they're anti-Gnostic literature uh, written by another Gnostic. Oh, I love you, man. It's awesome. I, it, it's just funny. That whole in-group, in out-group crap never gets old. Talk about tribalism. <sighs> Thank you, Stephen. Great question. I've never heard you say that about the Johan on epistles, I don't think. Uh, but interesting. Uh, believe yep. what you know, the first Semitic writing ever found was 600 BCE. I didn't know this. Um, Sorry, I'm getting some kind of echo. Let me see here. I need to turn. Yeah, it was um, you. It's you. There's an echo. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so the question is, the first Semitic writing ever found was 600 BCE. Um, you know, actually, I don't know that. Um uh, it depends on what you mean by Semitic. So we've got, and I'm not an expert in this in this material, <clears throat> but you've got the first civilizations in Mesopotamia, um, and ancient. Uh, so you've got Sumerian, which is not uh, a Semitic language, but uh, you do have uh, in North Syria developing the very first Semitic languages. And these then become Aramaic. And then Hebrew is essentially uh, Hebrew and Phoenician and then Arabic are offsprings of those earlier Semitic languages. So um, again, I'm not an expert, but I think the first Semitic writings uh, would be much earlier than 600 BCE. And they would be found on cuneiform tablets. But you'll have to, you'll have to get an expert on ancient Mesopotamia um, exactly. for the exact date. Thank you so much. I don't know how to pronounce your name, Bl Blasius. Hey, kind of new here. Thoughts on Disciplina Arcani? Arcani? Well, I again, I'm not an expert in the, in that kind of esoteric lore. Um, what I will say is the only thing that I can say is that um, early Christian movements were esoteric in many cases. And what we call Gnostic movements, Gnostic Christianities, were often esoteric. And that is, they practice initiations. They look like secret initiations. And this is what allows us then to compare early Christian movements with the contemporaneous um, mystery cults, which also practice secret initiations, um, some of them having to do with water or oil or, or whatever the case may have been. And then out of these movements, yeah, a grand history was was started uh, about esoteric Christianity and rejected knowledge. And this stuff does, I think, go back to antiquity. Like her hermetic cults are are a great sort of source for discipline arcani. Uh, but we, I'm not enough of an expert to tell you the development like through. Uh, throughout history, like the medieval and modern period. And uh, be on the lookout for the mystery uh, course, again, that I forgot to mention at the beginning, because it's going to be interesting. Mr. Litwell, what are your top two recommended books for an atheist to read? Well, I can only recommend books that like would be good for an atheist also really, really wanting to intelligently understand early Christianity. And... Uh, because even if you're an atheist, and it's totally fine if you are, I mean, believe me, I understand. Um, I think the way that an atheist um, 
shows that they are, in a sense, more patient and more intellectual is by actually <clears throat> knowing more than I the agree. average believer. And I think that those resources are, are out there, and I don't know where people are beginning. And so I, I'm, I'm not sure I can say, you know, these are the ultimate books. But I can tell you what are considered sort of classics, um, and uh, one of them being uh, Orthodoxy and Heresy by Walter Bauer, um, who this book was written in the 1930s, but it's it's still such a it's such a classic. Um, and actually, I based my book Found Christianity Found Christianities on Walter Bauer's book um, in part, and Bart Ehrman does a lot of his work based on this book by Bauer. Again, it's called Orthodoxy and Heresy. Um, yeah, what I would recommend is actually diving into some of the ancient uh, literature. So a lot of people, you know, they only read the Gospels. But what I'd really recommend is maybe picking up like uh, what's called ancient, uh, ancient Greco-Roman novels. Um, there's a nice book on those that includes all the Greco-Roman novels that we have, which are a really fun read and which are in many ways similar to the Gospels and written at the same time as, as the Gospels. So you can get a sense of what's the kind of contemporary literature. You might also want to pick up Plutarch's Lives. And I think there's a Penguin edition there. Plutarch is writing the same time as the Gospel writers are, and he's writing lives of famous people like the Gospel writers are trying to do for Jesus. And um, yeah, <laughs> I've exactly. been reading it lately too. Yeah, L lives of Caesars, or he's got um, you got Suetonius, lives of Caesars. Oh, is good. yeah, but, this but, is what you were saying, right? Oh, you said Plutarch. Plutarch. Sorry, Plutarch. Plutarch is a bit broader than the Caesars, and yeah, I got um, at least I, on Isis and Osiris here, but I don't have the lives right now. I, all my nice books point. are already packed up and gone right now, so I kept just a few on me. Oh, yeah, no worries. But yeah, I, I really dive into that ancient literature. I think you'll love it. Um, another great novel that you can re read that's really just really fun is uh, Apuleius's The Golden Ass, or sometimes called Metamorphoses. And that is extremely funny um, and also really educational. Because he'll talk about the Isis cult at the end of the book, and, but it's a novel. And it's basically, again, contemporary with most early Christian literature. And it kind of combines the gospel genre with the acts genre. And it's just fun to read. Thank you, Constellation. I got a blast through these here. Damon, Marcelina, Depiction of Jesus with Pyth and Plato. Apollonius seems a better fit. Thoughts on this and Jesus, Apollonius parallels or identities. Well, this is a great question. Marcelina, who's the one of the most famous carpocrations, um, so she does have, she does venerate Jesus with a painting that she thinks goes back to Pilate. But along with that painting, or maybe it was a small sculpture, she's got Pythagoras and Plato. Why not Apollonius? Well, it's because Apollonius wasn't famous enough yet. Uh, Marcelina and Apollonius are... Uh, roughly contemporary. Um, Apollonius was, you know, a, a generation before Marcelina. But um, when Ap it, the case of Apollonius is much like the case of Jesus, that he really only becomes popular about a century after his death. And so it's really in the late second, early third century where you start getting like this lives literature or gospel literature about Apollonius, which culminates with Philostratus who writes the only surviving life of Apollonius. Um, and yeah, I, I think, think the question, the parallels, would be, I think the question would be too long to talk about the parallels. I talk about, I can point you to my book, how the gospels became history, where I talk about um, the parallels in terms of miracles. And I talk about Pythagoras also in that book. That's how the gospels became history. And I, we can kick off a conversation there. Um, but yeah, it, it, this is much too long a discussion for just a YouTube live session. <laughs> but thanks. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I just told everybody, join the Patreon. We're going to check and see those numbers here in just a moment. 
at least give Dr. Litwa a reason why he wants to spend so much time here on Myth Vision. So please show him some love. Vaguely agnostic, no question, just a thank you. I could listen to Litwa for hours. That's a fact. Thanks I've been reading much. him for hours before this episode, actually. So <laughs> thank you, Vaguely. Bradford Baldwin, what is up? Lazarus hanging himself by a cliff to then drop down. That is best harmonization. Just joined your Patreon doc. Gonna dig into the Nag Hammadi series. Thanks so much, Bradford. Yep. So, and I should have mentioned that earlier that, yeah. So when you join the Patreon, I've got basically three full courses academic courses that I would offer to any a graduate or undergraduate. One is the Nagamati series where I take you through every one of these rejected Christian literature, uh, pieces of Christian literature. Uh, one is a course on my book, Found Christianities, which takes you through every rejected or hereticalized Christian of the second century. And then I'm now doing more detailed work on Carpocrates with because of the Carpocrates book that just came out. So I've got the only scholarly monograph on Carpocrates, a uh, very famous early Christian and made into a heretic later on, but really, really fascinating figure. So that's what you'll get when you get in the Patreon, as well as a lot of my scholarly articles, plus um, uh, all, all these interviews that I've been doing over the years. So uh, <laughs> yeah. um, join, uh, thanks so much for joining. Yeah, I was just talking to Bradford earlier on the phone today, actually. He's one of my Patreon members, so it's good that he's part of the family. And uh, I was painting while chatting with him, actually. We, we had a long <laughs> talk, but uh, thank you for uh, supporting Dr. Litwa Bradford, and uh, we'll be chatting, of course. Wayne Wright, thank you for the super chat. Those indulgences go far, my friend. Trust me. I really appreciate the support to the channel. It's just me, Tapora. What do you think about Jesus' teaching not coming out of Jewish tradition, but Greek Cynic teachings? Galilee was a Hellenized city near Gadara, known for its Cynic philosophers. Well, it's a it's another great question, and it's another reminder that this isn't an either or kind of a thing. Like if you find people telling you, "Well, it's Greek rather than Jewish, or it's Jewish rather than Greek," you it's sort of like. I mean, why? I mean, it, those sorts of boundaries are the boundaries that we create in the 20th, 21st century. Those didn't exist in, in, in antiquity. Mm. Like there were fluid identities, just like there's fluid identities today. Like I'm American, Australian. Uh, people can be maybe have Aboriginal heritage, but also have be Irish uh, or, you know, and people can have all sorts of identities, you know, they can be transgendered, they can be, uh, they can have both be part of European and African culture. I mean, we're all sort of mixed, right? Because we've all been doing this multicultural thing for a couple hundred years now. And the same thing in antiquity. So yes, obviously, you can be a cynic Jew and a Jewish cynic. And you can be a Jew living in a city of Palestine and know a bunch of these cynic traditions. And you could have a guy down the street yelling at you saying that he is a cynic. Absolutely. So, yes, yes. You could be a answer. cynic, apocalyptic Jew at that. Not just any. You could be both. You could, except the cynics are not really doctrinal. But yeah, I mean, you can have all sorts of combinations. Okay. Um, okay. And and so absolutely, the, the answer is yes and yes. He comes out of the Jewish tradition. He has equal access to cynic traditions. You don't even need to go to Gadara for that. I mean, it's a great place, but you don't need to go there because Galilee, it's got those people too. Thank you, Dr. Litwa. Constellation Pegasus, I've been telling Derek to get it to a kingdom hall before Armageddon occurs, and he refuses. I don't understand what his problem is. I think everybody in the chat should probably write up a dissertation about cognitive dissonance pertaining to why I haven't gotten into a kingdom hall, because it's all the evidence is right there. I don't know why I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. It's just we all know it's true, and we're just not following it. You know what I mean? But well, when you do, when you do enter, please put it on film. Um, <laughs> un unless you want to see me catch on fire when I walk through the doors. I already. Well, you won't burn, Derek. Your flesh will not burn. It'll drip off. 
but what remains, <laughs> a chariot will come. <laughs> Wayne Wright, thank you for the super chat, Wayne. Really uh, appreciate that support. That's the second indulgence you've received in one night. I don't think we can blame you for any sins that you've ever committed in your past or in the future for this. No, seriously, thank you for the, um, appreciate the super chat, seriously. And you said, I said a super chat question about Ephesians, but it wasn't attached with my super chat donation. How do you make them sing together? Okay, hold up. I just, I'm glad I caught you. This is the last it. Okay, what is the best evidence either for or against Pauline authorship of Ephesians? Seems like I see a lot of pulse theology, especially in chapter two. Pulse. Um, that may be Paul's theology, but yeah. <clears throat> okay, Paul's. Um, that's a great question. And, you know, Ephesians is, is another one of these texts that is really, really important for everybody to know and maybe not love, but at least to know. Um, <clears throat> I would say that um, there in Ephesians, it's a bit like John, where the author seems to have a very different situation than Paul had when he was, say, writing Galatians or Corinthians. Um, Ephesians is in like a whole different world, and it's sort of like a Gnostic world. Um, it's full of language about mystery. It's full of language about, um, it uses terms that, that Paul doesn't use, like pleroma or fullness. Um, it seems to have a theology in which Jesus is somehow married to the church and the church is somehow a heavenly entity. You don't really hear any of that in, in Paul. And then you have a lot of the sentence structure. And this is another reason why uh, reading in English is a real handicap, because when you look at the sentence structure, in the Greek, and when you're reading something like Galatians, you see very like punchy style. The same thing with Corinthians. You know, it's very almost staccato. Like Paul says, do, 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 do. And he, right. he, he makes a series of points. Isn't like the first two chapters of Ephesians, like one or two sentences. It's like this huge, never exactly. ending. Yeah. So reading Ephesians, it's like jumping into a German dissertation. You know, it, <laughs> it, it's, it's like the sentence never ends. And all the vocabulary is really, really long. And this fancy, flowery kind of language. And we've just never heard Paul talk like that. Now, I mean, again, that's not a smoking gun argument. But um, I would say the best argument is, yeah, we're dealing with an author who sounds most like other Christian texts in the early second century. And since we have a bunch of those texts to compare, letters like the Epistle to Barnabas and um, the first and second letters of Clement, those sound a whole lot more like Ephesians than Paul ever did. So when you're reading more widely in Christian literature, you can really see where the commonalities lie and get a better sense. That's why I always encourage people to read really large, widely outside the canon. Um, don't be a canon Christian, um, that is just, a that's almost nothing. And right. you lock yourself up into, you know, something that's unnecessarily restrictive. We have so much more that survive, folks. You have so much more of an opportunity to see other forms of Christianity at work. Don't die before delving into some of this other non-canonical literature, the apocryphal acts, the Nagamati literature, um, all these other letters that didn't make it in there. Really, don't miss that opportunity. Thomas, Mary, Philip, Acts of Peter, stuff that we talked about today, Acts of Philip. God, you know, I mean, it's all there, folks. Enjoy it. Mm, thank you, Wayne. What a wonderful way to end this particular episode. Go get a book. Like I said, it'll help you with your indulgences. Uh, Dr. Lit was written plenty of them. And he continues to do so. I was reading this one today. Yes, this day is the early Christian depiction of Jesus as a Mediterranean God. But then I ended up having to pick up We Are Being Transformed because you reference it a lot. And I say, OK, well, I obviously need to read that one if I'm going to come back and go to Yesus Deus. So 
I hope more people will actually get your works, your Hermetica too. There's you so got that's a lot that's one hundred and thirty three dollars though. Still on Amazon, we are being transformed. If you become a Patreon, that's free. Mm. Um, so I believe. What level do they have to join at? I believe you only have to join at tier two. Um, you'll you'll get everything at tier three. Um, but you yeah, are you a can, god. Yeah. Well, yes. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a there's a basic support at tier one and then tier two will get you a good amount and then tier three will get you everything. And then, yeah, so you can get that book. You can save yourself one hundred thirty three dollars um, just by giving, I think, what, like 10, 12? I don't know. <laughs> right. No, I mean, if you if you tithe into the kingdom, you know what they say, it compresses and then it multiplies. The blessings come out. This it's not the BS that they give you at those fake churches. This is the real one because you actually are getting immediate results. You put in 10 or 12 dollars, you get a hundred and whatever dollars out. It's like like that. So, um, OK, join right now. We're coming right back to it in just a moment. I want to see uh, Dr. Litwell. You got to tell me how we did. OK, Um also, I have the Patreon, worked my butt off. I cannot tell you how hard I work. Uh, I mean, I'm also working on taking care of my house right now, my mom and dad's house. And I'm hoping to make it to the West Coast soon because my three babies are already out there and they're waiting on me and Ryan, my wife, Mrs. Smith Vision. And uh, once I get there, I'm going to be able to even work harder than I already am because I've been devoted on painting and trying to get this house right. I don't have as much time to read and to put together some stuff. So consider helping me out also at my Patreon and the Unknown Gospel course with Bart's coming up. And I'm going to be launching a course with uh, with Dr. Litwa, actually, the gentleman here on the screen with us right now. And it is on the mysteries. You're not going to want to miss it because all of these other, let me go ahead and poo-poo on everybody else real quick for just one second, Dr. Litwa. Every other course, online course I've ever seen, you know, it's very like classroomy, it's very like I'm giving a lecture-ish. And don't get me wrong, it's a lecture, but it's like there are serious high-quality graphics and a ton of work has been put into editing it, so it's aesthetically pleasing, satisfactory to the eye, all of that. Oh, yeah, uh, become a god for $12.50. Who the heck wouldn't want to be a god at $12.50? Come on. Okay, so Dr. Litwa... I guess our results must be in by now. Fingers crossed people have joined. I don't know. Uh, what do you think? Well, I know uh, supposedly we have Bradford, so I count that a success. And, yeah, I mean, you get what you pay for, folks. Like, if you want a uh, real scholarship, um, you can get access to so much these days. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't ultimately matter to me too much about, um, you know, your quick decision today. What I care about everybody doing here today is really having access to the good scholarship. Whether you get that through me or somebody else, totally fine. But it's there. And if you if you want it and you just want to join for a month, then check out everything that's there. Do so. Uh, again, I've got a book deal. I can send you a signed book, um, and uh, yeah, I can beat the Amazon price. Uh, so let me know. Awesome. I hope more people will go. And uh, Michael Hill, I'm glad that Litwa doesn't hold a cup and sit on the side of the corner and go, all these years of my learning are worth nothing. You know, so can you please... Please be a charity case. No, Dr. Litwell, you work very hard, and I'm just a shameless plug. Seems Michael doesn't like it. So, Michael, have a good one, my friend. Um, there are plenty of people out there who appreciate hard work, and we do not live in a world where handouts are just given and you're supposed to work for free. It is what it is, and I don't have you on here. Uh, this is a lot of effort. Time is money. Academics cost money. The best I can do is leverage your books, your Patreon, to have your time and come educate the general public. Most people watching aren't paying a dime. It's really the good people that are out there that say, hey, I can afford 
to do that. And I love this so much. And I want to take this to another level in the community and help an academic like Litwa to make him show that we appreciate him to come back because time is money. It takes time away from your family, away from what work you could be doing to make an income and stuff. So um, when those kind of people come in, I just I, I wanted to address that. No, it's appreciated. And there's also one thing your viewers should keep in mind is that most religious scholars are still today funded through church and theology schools. So people like me, we we don't we can't teach in a theological school. We can't teach in a in a seminary that's church funded mm -hmm. because we don't want to we don't want to support the the church doctrine. That's not how we view scholarship we view scholarship as something different. So in the end, academics who are doing the real critical work, there's very few positions for us. And it's a sad thing to say in 2022, but the job market is grim for critical scholars. Most of the positions are, are somehow or other church funded or through a seminary and theology school that's supported by a denomination, or you have to write a statement of faith. Uh, and, and ascribe and sign it. And in order to teach Bible in, in America, it happens all the time. There's discrimination based on faith. So what you're supporting, I mean, you're not tithing to a church. You are tithing to people who don't get church support for obvious reasons. Um, <laughs> yeah. After so, one episode like today, <laughs> I mean, it's clear. Yeah. I mean, again, I don't consider myself in any way um, anti-religious or anti-church, but it, it is safe to say that I'm not going to be supported by those sorts of institutions. So when you're supporting me, you're su you're giving me the means to keep that scholarship coming that right. is critical and doesn't try just to support a, one particular Christian tradition and isn't afraid to say what I think. Yeah, I'm with you. Everybody's just giving a shout out. Soren, just so I can be clear, when I say good people, most people probably who aren't joining probably can't afford it. So they have this access to education for free. Uh, they want to take things further. I hope you didn't mean uh, take that as a in a derogatory sense of like, only the good people are supporting on Patreon or whatever. But I do believe I have, I used to think we were born horrible wicked wretched sinners who were deserving the fire of god all that crazy stuff um and now like i realize human nature for the most part people are good and they want to do things that are right and good especially when they value what what's being said and so that's all i'm saying i know that most people may not be able to it's been tough times and so we're not trying to tug at someone to give their last shekel into the jar and make a parable about it and say, oh, are you going to be that woman who's just going to give up that little last shekel? No, 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 no. If you can't afford it, do it. Stand behind a scholar who's bucking against the harmonizers, who's bucking up against those heretical heresiologists, if you will. I mean, I, your work is invaluable. In many respects, what you're doing is amazing. And I'm glad because we have plenty of priests and pr plenty of church father scholars who want to talk about how great and how true everyone from Justin Martyr and everyone's positions are. And you're coming in. You're not going, well, they're false or true. Oh, well, the heresies are false or true. You're painting a reality, a historical like template for people to see what was going on and let them make their mind up. That's what I like about you because you're not on the side of the heresiologist, so to say. I'm not saying like. You don't have your moments where you side with them about something, but it's like you're letting people see what was going on, the beef. Someone's going to look back in politics in America and go, who was right? Uh, well, you're going to read somebody just like we do with historians like Tacitus and Suetonius when they speak about certain emperors. We can't trust everything they're saying. They hated some of those guys. So did they really do those things or not? Anyway, I hope that people see that you're trying to come at this as unbiased, but with historical methodology and learn a thing or two. Anyway, I think the preaching is over now. I, I had to get that. <laughs> amen. Can I get an amen? Hallelujah. Uh, seriously, Dr. Litwell, you're amazing. <laughs> I really, really appreciate you. Uh, Graham, let's end on this one. Some scholars open windows. Dr. Litwa opens the garage door. 
All right. Well, and I've got more than a greasy bike to offer you. Uh, so, but thank you so much to everybody, Derek and everybody here. Really, really appreciate it. Um, it's very heartwarming. And, you know, I struggle personally um, getting this information out. So I really appreciate all of you coming. And I uh, love your questions. I welcome your questions on the Patreon. And I encourage everybody in your support for um, whatever you're looking for. But let's, yeah, let's just provide that really good, complex, nuanced information and take it from there. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Never forget, we are MythVision. Now let's enter the apocalypse.